Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your love. We thank you that you are here and that you're here to be encountered. You're here to bless. You're here to strengthen us. And Lord, we come in the door with all sorts of needs. Ones that we know about, ones that we don't. And so Lord, we pray that you would meet us and change us. Lord, that you would help us to seek you in all the ways in which you can be found. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to be talking this morning and praying through the parable of the sower, which is one that we're probably broadly familiar with, and there's something that's working in our favor and something that's working against us in terms of me leading this sermon. And so we'll start with the thing that works against us, which is I am not, I'm so bad at any kind of gardening or handy work project, and not only am I bad at, like, I've tried multiple times to, like, grow eggplants, and every single time they've died. Um, I also hate getting my hands dirty, <laughs> right? Like, I'm really, I was the kid who didn't run through the sprinkler as a kid because I didn't like the feel of the grass on my skin. So, I'm going to do my best to not say anything stupid about gardening or, um, you know, these sorts of things. There are people who know a lot more about farming in the room than I do, so I'm going to try to, like, shy away. The thing that works in our favor is the best parables to have to preach on are the ones where Jesus tells you what they mean because it, it, it makes it really easy. So um, we're, not trying, we're not trying to like, you know, this is, there's not a lot of new theology that's going to be happening this morning, uh, but we're going to talk through it. So if you would please turn to Luke chapter 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk through the parable, and then we're going to talk about why the church has placed this in the pre-Lenten season. And so today is Sexagesima Sunday, um, and so it is roughly 60 days until Easter. And Sexagesima Sunday is Don's favorite Sunday. Um, and because I'll be serving the Lord next Sunday on a cruise to Mexico with my family, um, whoo! Uh, I stole sex adjustment, and he has not, he's at, at no point has failed to remind me of this. So he's very good about helping me. So, but um, we're going to talk about why the church places this in the pre Lenten season um, and what, what role that has. So, Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. And so the first thing to recognize is Jesus is not telling this parable at the very start of his ministry. He has already gained a huge following. <coughs> and so there's a huge crowd that is following him wherever he goes and that has come out of every city. And so he waits to have a huge crowd to be surrounded, to then sort of drop a bomb on some people. Um, which is not necessarily the most successful philosophy of ministry, uh, considered abstractly. And yet this is what Jesus is going to do. So he waits, big crowd comes up, and he says, A sower went out to sow a seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. So the wayside was a footpath. And so between, within, the, uh, within the farmland, there'd be fields everywhere, and there were paths that were designed for the worker to walk, and they would cast seeds, or they would tend the plants from these paths. And so anything that people walk on a lot, the ground becomes quite hard and compacted. And so when seeds fall on it, they don't sink in at any depth. So they stay on the surface, and birds like seeds, and so they swoop in and seal the seeds. So nothing grows in the footpath, nothing grows in the wayside. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And so here, the idea is not actually that there are sort of rocks on the surface of the ground. The idea here is that there's a thin layer of soil, and beneath the soil, can you tell that I did research about yeah. preparation? <laughs> preparation say, I don't know anything about. But there's a thin layer of soil, and then under that is a layer of limestone, or sort of semi-porous rock. And so the roots go down a little bit, but they can't go down deep enough to really collect the water they need to survive. And so the plants sort of shoot up and they do okay so long as the rain is constantly coming. 
But as soon as the rain stops falling, as soon as there's a dry season or the sun beats exceptionally hard, they wither and die. Um, There's nowhere for the roots to grow. And so the plants die. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. So again, just, you know, I I know enough to know what weeds are, right? And so the plants grow up, the the vines, these sort of thorny vines come in, and they wrap around, and they... They steal the nutrients, they steal the sunlight, and they kill the plant. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop in a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus gives the interpretation of this parable. Right? And this is where we're going to kind of walk through. And something to realize here is there are three types of bad ground. There's the wayside or foot, footpath ground. There's the rocky ground. And there is the viney, thorny ground. And what Jesus does is take these and it actually inverts the themes of the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So in our baptismal service, when we baptize an infant and an adult, there's a part in which we renounce and rebuke the world, the flesh, and the devil, in which we pronounce our commitment to Christ to follow him and to not just ignore these things, but to actively distance ourselves from them. And so Jesus takes this, this order of world, flesh, and devil and inverts it and talks about each way in which the, the field can go sour, the, the soil can be bad. And so the world, just as a brief brief excursus, is not the people in the world or the stuff of the world. The world is a way of operating that is at odds with the kingdom of God. So when we say the world, what we don't mean is that to stay out of the world, we have to sort of retract or cloister ourselves away and not involve ourselves in anything. Um, Jesus elsewhere puts it to be in the world, but not of the world. And so the thought here that the danger of the world is that the thing that orients the way we live our lives is something other than the kingdom of God. And so when our political party wins, we cheer. And when our political party loses, we're despondent for weeks upon end. That is, we invest far more in our confidence in earthly human leaders than we do in the coming kingdom. Um, Or we follow the stock market so closely that any time our retirement fund loses 10%, we feel deep anxiety about our future safety and security. Um, Or where all of life becomes about getting a house, paying for the house, keeping the house clean, keeping a job, right? So the, the world is giving into ways of thinking and ways of feeling, emotions, that undermine our confidence and belief in God. This is what the, the world means. The flesh is the part of ourselves that wants things, and those desires are misordered. Those desires are off, off kilter. Um, and so again, the, we were created to love and to serve God, and there's a piece of all of us that wars against that and fights against that, the internal piece. So the world is sort of out there and kind of can sweep us along like a current. The battle of the flesh is inside. And then the devil, right? there is a personified evil that seeks to cut us off from our source of life and happiness and peace. And so there's a very personal enemy who has armies and who wars against us and against whom we have to war in the power of Christ. And so again, these are the the images of the sort of obstacles, those things that if we don't take care will own us. And so Jesus begins to talk about these in reverse order. So the devil, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where it was clear they weren't really listening? Have you ever gotten pulled or maybe just ran headlong into an argument with someone where it was really clear that they weren't willing to be wrong? And maybe it became clear to you that you weren't willing to be wrong. (laughs) There are times at which 
our words will not, it's like the word stops at the ears and doesn't make it to the mind or the heart, right? And so in the same way of the ground that's trampled and the seas just kind of rest on top, there are people who are not ready, their hearts are not ready to hear messages of love and wisdom and truth and power. And to continue to try to just throw seed at it as if you, if you just throw more seed, it's somehow going to, going to penetrate, doesn't work. And not only does it not work, but if we take the sort of pearls before swine, which is something else that Jesus, it, it can get you wrecked. Because if you continue to speak truth to persons and institutions that don't want to hear it, it can mean bad things for you. The soil is not ready. And so regardless of how good the message is, it's not that, and frankly, sometimes we are these people. There are times in our lives or areas of our lives where we simply aren't able and aren't willing to hear. And obviously, we, we usually can't know it, right? No one thinks of themselves that way. And yet, looking back, once the Lord changes that and softens it, we begin to be able to see. The flesh. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, in time of temptation fall away. And so again, with the with the wayside or the footpath, there's no, there's no growth at all. With the rocks, there's, a, there's an initial shoot. There's a joyful reception, right? You, you tell these people a good thing, they hear about the gospel, and they, they respond like the rich young ruler. And they come, they gather close to Jesus. Um, they hang on every word until it gets tough. Until Jesus tells them, sell all you have and give to the poor until Jesus' path turns away from glory and exaltation and toward the cross. And then the, the self-preservation and the fear and the anxiety begin and they, they back up and they distance themselves. Uh, it isn't hard to follow Christ when everything is going well. It is very hard to follow Christ when the sun beats down and the rains won't come. And for those who have no root, for those who haven't learned through repetition and through slow, steady growth to drink deeply of the wells that God provides, they wither and they die. And so we have to be careful not to judge a fruit before it's time. And we have to be careful not to mistake the fact that we follow well on the good days as some evidence that we've actually allowed our roots to penetrate where they need to go. What do we look like on our bad days? What are the patterns that we give into? Because if you're anything like me, you tend to judge yourself based on your good days and you'd kind of write off your bad days. Well, that's not really me. That's not really who I am. And yet those days are meant, and the pain of them is meant to reveal this part that God wants to heal, that God wants to bless, that God wants to touch and to change. And then the world. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they had, have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. This is the one that really gets me. Um, as I pray through this passage, as I think through it, this, this is the one I most struggle with for me, and it may be a different one for you. But I, I work a job where most people wear their busyness as a badge of honor. Right, where the first answer to how are you doing may involve the words good or so-so, but it always, always is a coming out, good, just really busy. And though you sort of like are complaining about it, you wear it as a badge of honor, as if those who are not busy, those are not constantly being forced from, from one thing to the next or somehow less than or lazy. 
Um, I have a house and it takes work to upkeep a house. I have kids and it takes work to parent them. And it becomes easy to get choked with the stock market and how the cryptocurrency that I invested in is doing that day, which is nightmarish. Um, and to follow the news, and it, the, thing, the thing that gets me is, when I ask myself, why, why am I spending time here, here, and here, doing these things, and not here, here, and here, it's because I say, I'm tired, or I'm maxed out, or I'm too busy. And the question here with the thorns and the plant is, we make time for the things that are important. We spend money on the things that are important. We have conversations with other people about the things that matter to us. And so are we investing in the good of the plant or are we investing in the good of the vines? That's the one that gets me. Because it is easy to get carried away. It is easy to let the house and the stock market and the job become all we're about. Because it's there and it's right in front of our face and if the bills don't get paid, things go poorly for me and for mine. And while none of that is bad, if, that, if the living of that causes me to lose sight of the why, if it causes me to lose sight of the kingdom, if all of my time is spent here and little or no of my time is spent with him, then eventually all you are is vines. Eventually all you are is thorns. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. And so the first question is, do you want to be good ground? And probably you don't make time to come to church on a Sunday if the answer is no, right? So we're gonna assume, <laughs> we're gonna assume that that's, and so then the second question is, what, what do we do? There, there are people who will preach this passage as if you're sort of one type of ground and that's all you are and you have very little to say or to do about it. It's just kind of, it's gonna be what it is. And if that were true, Jesus wouldn't make the point to preach the message. And so the question is, if the ground is wrong, how do we fix the ground? Right? If the soil of our heart is hard, then it needs tilling, right? And I, had to, I did definitely Google the word tilling to make sure I was gonna use it right before I said it. I'm pretty sure it's tilling. That is, if it's so hard that nothing can penetrate it, you have to get a shovel or a pickaxe or a big heavy piece of machinery and you have to break it up. And the harder the ground is, the more violent, the more disruptive that process has to be. And one of the reasons the church has put this passage before Lent is the point of Lent, the point of fasting, is to break up that ground so that the seeds can be implanted, so that it can drink deep the seed and the water and the nutrients it needs to grow. And so the church is inviting us to, to introspect, to take account of the soil of our hearts. And we are all a mix of these different types. Right? None of us is just one. And so there are parts of our souls, there are parts of our lives, there are parts of our emotions and our thoughts where the Lord plants a seed and it just blossoms. And there are parts of our lives where it sort of shoots up and then it sort of, things get tough and it... And there are parts where we're not even yet ready to hear. And so the, the place to start is to ask the Lord to diagnose your soul. And not to show you everything he sees, but to show you just enough to show you the ways in which you're to respond. 
Show me enough for the day. And to begin to seek him and follow him in action as he provides. And so I skipped over a, the middle part of this passage. Um, and we're going to come back to it because this, this is one that messes people up. And so Jesus mentions about the soil. And before he goes on to explaining what each of these soil types is and how it sort of maps on, it says, Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And so what it sounds like is, you all are in the know, so I'm going to tell you what this means. These other people are suckers and they're going to be left out, right? Does that, so the first question is, beyond, does that sound like a loving God to you? No. So that's, that's your first indication that that's not the way this goes. The second is, if you read further in the passage to the next, the next part of the uh, the story. It's quite clear that this isn't what Jesus is saying. So verse 16. So no one when he has lit a lamp covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed or sets it on a lampstand but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. And follow, follow closely here. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore take heed how you hear for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. So that Jesus had two things that are important here. One, the whole reason you have a light is so that people will see it. So we're not going to broadcast a light and then sort of dim it down and focus it on a small group. Two, everything that is secret Everything that is secret will be revealed. And so then the question becomes, why these people? Why now? We cannot understand a parable properly without walking closely with Jesus. We cannot receive and live out the truth simply by hearing a message. And so what I think is going on here is that it was given to the people who were following Jesus most closely, who had committed to living with him in the easy and the bad, who hung on every word, who had given up jobs and family to follow him. That is the people who are living in a relationship of intimacy with him are the ones who get it. And that can be anyone. But it was given at this time to this group. Because if all we needed was a textbook, then Jesus did not have to be born. God did not need to become man. If all we needed was a message or a preacher, then Jesus did not have to die. And so if the external message, if a philosophical treatise on who God is and what, what he's about and how you live the good life, if that were all we needed for our condition, then that, would, that is what God would have given. But what we need is the deep connection of an intimate relationship with the infinite God. On the good days and on the bad. And so the deeper meaning is reserved for those who are seeking intimacy. Additionally, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I believe that Jesus is saving the crowds. Right? The rich young ruler hears the truth and because he's not ready to receive it, goes away despondent. And there is a two-edged nature to grace when grace is given and it's not responded to, the soil of our heart doesn't sort of stay as it is. It hardens. It tightens up. It compacts. And when grace is responded to, however heart, 
the so- or however hard the soil is to start, it begins to loosen and unpack. It begins to soak up the things that are given to it. And so what Jesus is doing in this parable is inviting us into a deeper relationship with him. He's giving us an account for the different ways in which our soul can look, the different directions in which we might head. And he invites us to join him if we want to get better. Because without him, it doesn't matter how hard you hit the ground with the shovel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your love. And Lord, all of us have at different times and in different ways given in to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've made compromises we ought not to have made. We've done things we ought not to have done and we've left undone those things which we should have done. And Lord, we thank you that however often we mess up and however deep our sin, that your grace and your forgiveness go further. Lord, that you are always quicker to forgive than we are to receive it. And Father, we pray that you would get us out, break us out of this endless cycle of mistake, receive forgiveness, mistake, receive forgiveness, and that you would till the soil of our hearts and Lord, that you would help our hands know where they belong on the plow. Or that you would show us the vines that need to be pulled. Or that you would show us those parts of our lives, those ways in which we spend our time or our money or our energy that are evil or that while perfectly fine are not the best. And Lord, that we would begin to prune and to respond that you would give us a hunger, that you would convince us that things can be different, and that we would get so hungry for it that we would join you in the work of softening our hearts, that you would bless us and strengthen us, that you would give us every gift and every grace we need to follow you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven.